Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Marco Morales, and today's talk is going to be about process of code um, with the scale element to it. Um, it's, it's a topic I'm fairly passionate about because I've been trying to figure this problem out for, for quite some time. I'm going to be giving you some guidance on the things that I've seen and experienced and try to prescribe one way of going about it as, as based on what I've learned. Um, so first about me, um, I, I have a long history in software development. I used to do build management, release management. Um, I was agile trained, you know, a lot of DevOps type of behaviors over the years. Um, so I, I've seen a lot. Um, I also have been delivering professional services or as a vendor. Um, I've seen a lot. I've seen a thing or two, those kind of things. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I, I have knowledge of how people tend to behave um, in those environments and some of those pro uh, problems. As a result, I'm trying to share with you what I've seen as good patterns and, and again, hence the prescription. Um, and that cloud in, includes things that I thought might track with some of you. I mentioned Chicago to some people. Um, so the problem is, you know, the way I, I thought about this is, you know, how would I describe this, right? And so as a user, I want to develop my, I want to define my DevOps processes quickly. Um, I want to do it efficiently, and I want to be able to handle my use cases for my automations, and I also want to work with my members and my other teams. Um, but it's difficult to do all these simultaneously is, is my general experience. And, and as I thought about this, you know, the, the reason I, you know, I see it as being difficult is uh, tends to be the UI. Um, you know, our tools, a lot of web front ends, they're really, really good. Um, they're really well suited for problems that you can see on a screen. One or two pages, um, you have a great um, click in, fill in the blank experience, and it guides you with online help. Um, but the problem with that is when you have to do a lot of those things. So, you know, a very common for most people is if you have like builds, right? If you have to do a bunch of build configurations, you don't want to be doing that a whole bunch of times. Um, if you have variations between say something like a build, um, you know, this team has, you know, a funny hat on their process. You have to do a lot of clicking and manipulating side by side. It's, it's a tricky, it's a tough problem. It's a lousy problem to work on. Um, and it's also very difficult for people to co-develop on a UI side by side. It's, it's a one person job. It's, it's not something where you and I can both be manipulating that system in the same UI um, because only one person should be modifying and pressing that OK button. So that's the nature of a problem that I've seen with a number of these automation systems that try to run some kind of job or process or something to get something done. And from my perspective, I've done a lot of automation around builds, testing, deployments, those kinds of DevOps problems, and this, hence the, uh, the, the backdrop for this thing. So that's why I see the problem as being difficult, it's the UI. So a solution I see is process as code. And so what really, one of the things I wanted to codify the description is, with process as code, think about your work as a product. Um, it's, it's no longer something I'm doing on the side in the UX, but now I'm responsible for delivering this product, and that product is your process. Um, your product is, is the code, um, and when I start treating it as a code, you know, you should really consider applying your company's software development techniques, right? If you have code reviews or whatever it is, you should consider using that for your process as code. Um, it is a company asset, so it's going to be protected. It's going to be in version control. It's going to be whatever policies are in place. This is something you should embrace when you do something like process and code. And it's also easier, I believe, for teams to achieve desired behaviors of sharing and collaboration. So frequently in UXs, in those systems, people will design something and no one knows why that variable or that text or whatever is in the screen. With this kind of embracing of process code, I believe people can expose, it becomes less opaque um, in an MRV. So your processes, as a result, I believe are gonna be designed um, to better meet the needs of your, of your organization because it's no longer specific to the, uh, the, or, uh, the individual. It is part of your, uh, your company. So real world examples, no names are given here. So one large US bank had um, several hundred applications um, deployments and my team helped them model their system and everything was done in a domain specific language. It was all processes code. There wasn't, a whole, there wasn't any UX, it was, it was just, auto generated that's really big for those teams that want to achieve that kind of scale. Um, there's a large brokerage firm who, um, who wanted to achieve a template-based design. You know, I don't want to be doing this 100 different snowflakes. I want to have one general template. And that was a problem I saw solved with process code. You know, a lot of looping, a lot of scripting. But it worked really well so that they could onboard however many they wanted very quickly. Um, there's a retailer I work with. Um, they had 
uh, a spreadsheet with endpoints. These are their servers um, across the country. Um, and they said, why can't I use that data in the spreadsheet as a driver for the definition of where my software is going to? And that was, that was a very easy problem to solve. Um, and most recently, I was working with an uh, online retailer who had um, microservices. And their problem was really nice because the definition of the microservice tends to be data. It's the name of the uh, microservice, the path, CPU con, and all that. And that was a JSON file that we just absorbed into a model and made it work. So when they go from 200 or whatever, how many microservices in the future, it's just a matter of adding extra data. So those are things that are, please keep in the back of mind, are things that I believe are achievable when you embrace something like process of code. Um, so assumptions. So one of the, you know, there's, there's a number of assumptions I think you should have in mind if you want to embrace this kind of technique. One is, um, you know, I think you should, you know, work with a system that supports some kind of domain specific language, a DSL. It's really popular for a Groovy to be present. I happen to be familiar with systems that use Groovy and, and it's, it's a great open, you know, system, you know, a lot of online references, books, whatever you want. It's no longer proprietary. It's, it's open out there. Um, when your DSL supports objects, um, and its attributes uh, or object hierarchy, I think that's a huge upside um, to, to the environment. There are examples where sometimes that doesn't occur, and I'll probably describe those things uh, maybe in the next, next line, is the, the objects help you declare um, what your model looks like. So what I see in my world is I can declare an application. I can declare an environment. I can declare a uh, process in essence that you're scripting. And scripting doesn't have um, attributes. Um, if you're like an object-oriented person, and that makes it really hard to understand processes code. And I'll show you some examples how the object-natured um, uh, processes code helps you out. Um, Import-export. Um, so you know, back in the day, some systems will only allow you to export. Um, I think if your system can allow you to import and export, you know, you're you're going to be in the right spot. Um, so the, ultimately, you're working on problems of scale. You know, it, I'm sorry, you, and you have to be working on problems of scale. You know, you have a lot of servers, a lot of users, a lot of processes, a lot of environments, whatever. It's, it's a big number, and that XKCD chart, which most of you probably know, XKCD, it is relevant, right? You don't want to automate, you know, like crazy something that you only do once. You know, this is you. You have to do it more than once, and and use a chart, you know, as as you think is needed. So best practice number one. Um, I, I tell people, you know, you really got to use a version control system. You know, a lot of systems have UI based, inline scripting. I would recommend, you know, use something. I use Git. You can use whatever you want. Um, this helps you delivering your code as a product, right? It's a deliverable to other people. You know, your online documentation, your README. It's it's a really good thing. I've seen too many projects that don't have the, the, the damn README. That's quite frustrating. Um, if you have installation scripts, Include those as well. So sometimes people will deliver, here's my project. I don't know how to run it. Include an installation script. Um, and one behavior I've seen recently is I've seen some people embrace processes code and they have sprint-based deliverables where they demonstrate this. At the end of my two weeks, I am going to demonstrate how I automated my, uh, my processes since last time. And that goes over really well. Other, if you only, oh, if you only treat your repository as a file storage, again, no readme, it's just some dumping ground, you're, you're probably not doing it right. Um, so one thing I tell people, when, and I do this myself, is, you know, when you do, when you start embracing the journey, I say stub out in your, in your, uh, in your UI. And, and it does seem a little counterintuitive. Why would I use my UI to build my initial model? Um, I think it's a great way to get your initial feel for the system. So in this screenshot, I have a pipeline and I just have a bunch of tests, but you may have multiple steps. You may want to model on how your process works in your system. And you know, I encourage that, right? Put names in it, figure out where things fit, figure out where your naming conventions are gonna get broken or fixed. You know, um, maybe your environments belong here or whatever, um, but those are really good. And create a skeleton. Um, Create a skeleton with stubs. I really do use Echo Hello World. Um, I mock up a full pipeline, um, and then I run it. Um, it runs in a few seconds, and, and the best part is that when you run it, something like this, which is all stubs, um, the result is that it goes fast and it's green. And who doesn't want to see a green you know, build operation, deployment, or whatever? It may not do anything, but it looks great, and it starts to get you feeling good because it's a positive affirmation, and you can start iterating on that simple model to make it better and better. So that's your initial view, right? Start with stubs in the UI, get it working. Um, next, 
I tell my teams or my customers or whatever, you know, take those stubs and export them. Right, and you know, generating DSL or Groovy in this case um, helps you see the whole structure. You can see how it's laid out. You can figure out, you know, where are the repetitions. You can figure out what are the redundant things. Where are the null assignments for the optional things that I don't care. You know, figure those out and start trying to understand where to start optimizing your code. It's, it's, I think it's a, it's a great practice. It gets you familiar with things. And sometimes you might see fields like, I didn't know I should have that field in there. Um, I always thought that was optional, but it might be good. But a lot of the systems that I've seen, I've seen more than a few, you know, do support all this kind of structure. So I encourage you, please go ahead and do something like that. So you export your stubs um, and, and you're ready to use it. So the anti-pattern I want to describe here is where too many people start off and say, look, I have my model. I export it, I've, I'm doing processes code. And, and the answer is no, that's not right. Um, exports are, it's, it's a machine generated output. It's gonna be verbose, um, but it's not a real model, right? It's just, it's just a data dump. Um, and, what you, and, it, and it tends to include definition and state. And state, and as I define it, would be maybe some numbers or variables that, that our examples are here, right? So I've seen people do these dumps but it includes an embedded build number, a counter, right? Build one, two, three, four, five, whatever, or date strings, or it may include an embedded artifact version, or it may include some kind of name value pair that your team is using, you know, because you got it up and running. Um, that is not part of your process. That's, that's state information, and I, and I would encourage people to think of it as I am defining, an, uh, the def I mean, I'm providing a definition of how, how my automation works and I need to separate the state information next. So that's, that's my guidance on this slide. So what does that mean? Isolate your infrastructure requirements, isolate your state information from, your, from the actual definition. So this is your, your initial conditions. Um, they could be, I have 100 resources or endpoints. Um, it could be, I have credentials, so, so oftentimes with these Linux systems, we need a token, we need a username, password. That shouldn't be part of your definition. It's part of the infrastructure or your state information you might be using. Um, artifacts, right? I'm gonna deploy version one, two, and three of this artifact. It's not part of your definition. It's information you're gonna use during your process as code endeavor um, and the initial build numbers. And when you solve this, um, I, I, I don't know what the real name is, but I call it the first time in problem. The, the folks who have been doing automation with like build systems tend to know this is that first build always stinks because you don't know how to get the right build number or version number and once you get it running once, now it's working, right? So the, the emphasis here is if you can figure this out, you have your first time in problem solved. Um, once you see your export, once you see how things are going in your loops, I encourage folks to next create a data model um, and a test harness. A data model, it, uh, so the the reason I say it is when we use UIs in our popular tools, um, there's a data entry exercise, right? The name of the thing, its behavior, what's the URL, whatever. That's, that's data entry. Um, I use JSON, you can use whatever you want, but that data model, it becomes the inputs to my model, right? It's just, I'm gonna feed it to some kind of script that's my DSL. Um, and I get to make sure that the data going in is correct. The script on the other hand, the DSL, is designed to you know, work on common data, common processes. And you know, if you were to write a test harness against that data, and this example here is an example of a test harness, where the first one is, let's imagine I have a list of applications, right? I'm gonna iterate you know, for, all, for each of my application, I'm gonna print its name. And for each of my applications, I'm also gonna find how many services, microservices are in there, and I'm gonna print its name. And for each of my microservices in that, I'm gonna print out how many containers are within it, right? This makes sense as a hierarchy. This is a great initial test harness to make sure that my data entry is correct. And this is a pattern I use often, right? I have a bunch of containers, I have a bunch of applications, I have a bunch of machines, a bunch of users, whatever it is, just do this thing, make sure it works because you don't wanna be debugging on a, say an implementation, you'd rather just use something like this. Same thing with environments that where I'm de 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 deploying my software and pipelines, right? Pipelines, dev, int, prod, whatever you see. Just go ahead and make sure that all those details are correct. It helps you make sure that your data format is correct and you can start figuring out where, where am I gonna do things better. Um, I see this as the same spirit as test-driven development. You know, you're, as you're defining your data and your models, you get this relationship. Um, and, and, and then I also see the need for, you know, creating your production data and a subset your test data. You know, I've worked with examples where my production data was hundreds I don't want to be testing with that. So I get a small bit, 
I run it and that operation runs in a few seconds versus several minutes. It's, it's a better user experience than most people who've written software would probably agree. Um, and when you do this pattern, right, when you solve all these different things, this is where you start figuring out where your special sauce is, right? The one team, everyone's doing Java, but that one team wants to do something special in their one process. And then you get to ask the question, you know, is that really necessary? Or are you doing something we should be considering? Or can we make it optional? Those are the questions that help everybody identify why is that one outlier there? Or am I missing out on something? And this is, this is special sauce or snowflakes as some people might um, identify them. Um, during this whole process, iterate through small changes. So I use Git. Um, I make a lot of changes. I do a lot of local commits. Um, it's, it's just the way I run, but it tends to help me feel better about what I'm doing because the small changes, build, test, whatever you want to call it, it gives me fast feedback cycles and I get to make sure I understand enough of what I change. The big bang changes, they always screw you up. Um, I say commit early, commit often. It's like voting. You need to make sure you do it. Um, so here's an example, real world. So, the, uh, so it's a post out on GitHub. There's a small URL in the, in the corner. And what happened is I encountered a customer that had this, this spreadsheet of data, right? They had hundreds of endpoints. And I thought, well, how am I going to do this, right? Get the spreadsheet online. I found an Excel to JSON converter. I, I could have programmed it, but I decided that was faster. Um, and I created a, a JSON file where it had the, the name of the machine, the IP address, you know, what state it was located, and other time zones and other things. Um, I wrote a script which I condensed here. I removed white space and maybe took out a couple extraneous lines. But this script is part of a 20 line loop that just does for every item in there, create, what we call them a resource in this system. We create a resource that points to that server. It's a hell of a lot better doing this than having to go through the UI 200 times or data entry 200 times. The data entry was already there. They had a spreadsheet. This, was, this is how they manage their system. And that was really easy. And I think I have it here. The, uh, my, you know, my test data was five or 10. You know, I did a hundred, you know, several hundred servers in 27 seconds, right? Yeah, I wrote some script, it took a little bit of time, but that's a lot better than going through whatever it would take to make a mistake hundreds of times because you fat fingered something correctly. And again, it's, a, it's an excerpt of a 28 line script. So moving on, um, other advice. So we were moving around, we're doing experts, we're iterating, what do you do? Start trying to figure out what are your top level definitions, your, your, your big things versus detail. And so what I consider top level definitions would be things that are relatively static. Um, in a, and in your environment, your teams probably work with things like the dev environment or the QA and prod. That's probably not going to change very often. That's a top level item. Um, your applications, whatever you work on, right? Storefront may be the name of your application or shopping cart or something that's business logic. Those things don't tend to change very often. Those are top level items. Um, they tend to work really nice in the hierarchy. It's generally easy to create the, 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 the top level items very fast and efficiently. And you know, the other ones are pipelines. But you know, this would be something that I would call boilerplate and it helps you establish the skeleton of your system. It's something that works really, really fast and now you've got the essence of your application, your environment, whatever it is, your top level item, you've got the essence working right away and you can build structure around it. Separately um, for those custom items, maybe team A or application B or environment C, whatever your snowflakes are, that could be handled in a separate override, right? And so a lot of these systems, because they use a declarative model, I, think I can declare this server and call it Marco. Um, and, and so on. But for that team, I'll override because the declarative model lets you generally say, if it exists, create it. I'm sorry, if it exists, override it. If it doesn't exist, create it. So we're just gonna override with certain special behaviors and that tends to work really, really well. You isolate the two. Um, I can offline show you or describe examples, but it tends to be a really good pattern that I've found helps you know, keep people moving along the way they need to. Um, so here's another example, 200 microservices. So I work with a team, they had 200 microservices. Um, they didn't want to walk through the UI those 200 times. And what I have are two SNPs and the colors are, are meant to kind of just let you visually see. The top part is a, is a you know, compacted version of the JSON where you know, the mapping had, had parameters, right? And so, so this is for people who do OpenShift. Um, you know, there's words like um, update, um, node ports, those things, and that was specific for their application. It was part of their definition. 
So the way it was rendered in the script right below it um, is I'll just do this auto assignment. And, and the reason I show this is for them, they just had a whole bunch of JSON with these different parameters. So I don't know if anyone here is doing OpenShift, but you can, you know, node port means something and you will know, uh, I get it, right? So maybe they don't do, maybe they do load balancing or maybe they do something else, but that's just a data driven definition. And the assignment, which is just code, picks up the data and does the right thing. This is, this is how you want it to work. Um, below, you know, I guess another example for our CPU cons. So the example there was in their, uh, in their development environments, they usually had small CPU cons or small number of instances, you know, half a CPU, whatever. But in production, they put much beefier machines or, or whatever concept of beefier it was. And that was just data driven, you know, the assignments, you know, that they would do as they needed. So that, that was a great example. The team really liked just having to manage a JSON file rather than the UI and all the other stuff. Um, so my biggest challenge during this was just trying to figure out groovy syntax. Um, it, it wasn't even automation. It was, it was a programming exercise. Like I, I didn't know, you know, how do you do arrays? How do you do hashes? How do you do whatever these things? Once I figured it out, the, the rest of the problem just fell out really nicely. And solving the, 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 the programming, you know, doing the programming homework or exercise helped me create a system where whatever their length was, 10, 100, 200, 500, it doesn't matter, right? It's just, it's just data. And that's, I think, what we want to achieve is whatever you have out there, we'll be able to handle it because you're doing the right thing. Um, so we're moving along. We have loops. You know, when you do data exports or DSL exports in these systems, you're, you're going to get everything identified line by line, right? If you have 200 servers, they're all going to be listed 200 times. Um, so what I would encourage is when you see those things, try to figure out how can I take it apart and where can I get, you know, my list of data so that I have a tight loop. And this pseudocode on the right is meant to evoke you know, what you might expect, right? At work, we have teams, right? And for every team, they're working on an application. And for every application, I'm gonna have one or more software pieces and they're gonna have processes and so on and pipelines. And that's, that's the way the structure tends to work. That's the way this process is coded because these systems that have objects and have hierarchies, they tend to lend themselves very nicely to it. Um, yes, I'll keep moving. So last, there's only a couple more slides. Um, this is one of my favorites. Um, my team thinks I'm crazy. I, I, I do a lot of tests and I, I destroy my machines, right? I, I delete the VM, delete the vagrant, and I rebuild it, right? And if you can destroy you know, everything to the ground and rebuild it, then you're in great shape. And so the examples are, are fantastic, right? Delete it, rebuild it, it works. Delete it here or build it over there, it works. That's a lot of, um, you know, you may not need to solve that problem for your business, but you know you have a lot of independence of, I need to have this set up and this up. It's, it's taken care of. It's a great system to have. Um, and the words I have in there, you know, for those who use Vagrant, you know, Vagrant Destroy is popular. Or deleting everything in a directory, that's another way of deleting things. Or, you know, if you have, uh, in this other case, it's like a, you know, sub command for API based tools, deleting projects or whatever. Those are examples I, I would encourage folks, if you can do this, you, you, you are in a much better uh, spot with processes code. Let's see, one more. Problems. So I, I thought about this, you know, when do you have problems? So this, this is where in the DevOps world, there's, there is a cultural element, right? Um, so sometimes, you know, the, the first one is, I, I want to solve world peace or, or do the right thing from minute one. You, you know, don't do that. Um, you know, try to sm start small and then get big. You know, the, the overambitious activities, they never work. So, so don't even bother that. The middle one is really the one where I mentioned about the culture is, there are some environments that just, they aren't well suited for DevOps behaviors. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to be uniform, but the organization doesn't want you because my team isn't gonna change and they have a lot of power, you know, you're gonna struggle. Um, and, and you have to try to figure out how to work with the team to improve that situation. Um, people here have probably known, you know, hey, we're in an environment where our passwords expire 30 days, every 30 days, including the ones that are running our services. You know, that's, that's a real pain. Um, you know, your service accounts probably don't need that, but people, maybe they do. That's, that's a problem. If people are in teams where they gerrymander their roles, right? Hey, I'm in development, but I get to touch this and only I can do that, then, then you're gonna have a problem because that means you can't influence how we work together and you can't institute process code because they're always gonna have, I've got the exception that you have to handle me, not me handle you. Um, 
other examples are if, if your process are truly custom, right? They're, everything's different. You know, have a lot of works of art or snowflakes. It, you're going to struggle. I, I don't know how to guide you on that. Um, it, it could be that you're doing process for just a one time, but that's a lot of investment for, for the type of work you're doing. Um, in summary, so it's a process code, a set of behaviors and disciplines, software. Um, your enterprise should consider if you, know, you want to define things quickly, efficiently, and with collaboration, especially if you have large numbers. Um, and the very, very last slide is a GitHub link. Um, this presentation will be published. Um, I have a blog or two with additional links um, that just describe in, in high-level terms some of the, the specifics of how this works. Um, that's it. Any questions or answers will be about five minutes, I think. That's easy.